We welcome you to God's house this evening, and we're going to commence our worship tonight by singing the words of the hymn, Is There a Heart That Is Waiting, Longing for Pardon Today? Hear the glad message proclaiming, Jesus is passing this way. And we'll sing this hymn, keeping our seats, and let's sing as on to the Lord. Let's come before the Lord in prayer this evening and again seek his face that he might draw near to us even in this service tonight that we will know his presence and be conscious that he is speaking even to our hearts. Let us seek the Lord together. Heavenly Father, we thank thee that once again this evening we can still our hearts before thee in prayer We would think of the words of the psalm that exhorts us to be still and to know that thou art God. And we thank thee tonight that again we can come aside into thy house and we can gather together to worship thee. And we pray this evening that thou will grant us that grace and help to worship thee in spirit and in truth. We think of how the Savior spoke of those who drew near unto him with their lips, and yet their heart was far from him. We ask tonight that that will not be our experience, but rather that in our hearts and from our hearts we will draw near unto thyself. We pray that we will not, just as it were, merely go through the outward form of worship, 
But Lord, we pray that truly tonight we will know what it is to draw near unto thyself. We pray that thou will draw near to us tonight. We thank thee for the promise of the Savior that where the two or three are gathered together in his name, that he will be in the midst. We thank thee for thy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, who not only dwells within each believer, but we believe even as we assemble together is in our midst tonight. And we pray this evening that thou wilt cleanse us afresh again by the merit of the precious blood as we draw near in the name of the Lord Jesus, as we come again that new and living way, as we come by that blood-sprinkled pathway even unto thy throne of grace. We thank thee tonight for the gospel. We rejoice that the gospel is still the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth. We thank thee for thy word. And we thank thee it is through even the foolishness of preaching that thou dost see of them that believe. We thank thee it is the entrance of thy word that gives light even to the soul. And we rejoice that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we pray tonight that thou will come and minister to each of our hearts. We pray again for each child of God who is seeking to press on with thee. We pray tonight that we will know what it is to rejoice in the Lord, that we will be even conformed more and more onto the image of thy dear Son. We pray again for any child of God who has wandered away and grown cold of heart, that even tonight thou will stir them up in their souls and draw them again into that closer walk with thyself. And then, Father, tonight we pray for any that are still unsaved and out of Christ, still on that broad road that leads to destruction. We pray that in thy mercy and grace that thou will convict them of their sin and bring them even tonight to that place where they will turn from their sin and by faith receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. We acknowledge tonight that salvation is of the Lord and we pray tonight that thou will do thy work we know, Lord, as your people, and even in the preaching of your word, that we are simply instruments. But, Lord, we pray that we will be effective instruments, even in thy hand. We do thank thee for the power of thy word, that it is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank thee for the power of thy spirit, even applying thy word to hearts and lives. Again, this evening, we remember those that are not able to assemble in the house of God. We think of many, even through the land tonight, who would love to be gathered in a place such as this, but are not able. Those laid aside and shut in, some in hospital, some in nursing homes, some in their own homes. We lift them up to thee tonight, and we pray that they will know thy presence with them in a special manner. We're conscious, Lord, on the other hand, there are many who could be found in such a place as this, and yet have not that desire in their hearts. We pray tonight that even for such in their own homes or in some other place, that thou wilt even speak to them. Maybe some are family members of those even gathered in the congregation. Lord, we pray that thou wilt speak and even draw others to thyself. Cause many, even through this land and further afield tonight, to even face the reality of eternity, and face even the reality of their accountability to thee. And we pray that they might be brought to consider even the great need of their souls. And so, Lord, we thank thee again tonight for all of thy goodness and all of thy mercies. We acknowledge that thou art a great God, and thou art greatly to be praised. Thou art worthy of our praise. And we pray tonight that we will know what it is, even in thy presence and before thee, to remember that thou art one, even to be feared and to be had in reverence in the assembly of the saints. So, Lord, come now and shut us in with thyself. Continue with us, we ask of thee, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing again, please. The words of the hymn, I stand amazed in the presence 
of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Let's sing these words together. Let's turn, please, in God's Word tonight to the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John in the chapter 12, and we're going to read from the verse 12 of John chapter 12. John chapter 12, 
And in the verse 12, we read, On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's coat. These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of his grave, and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew. And again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it, said that it thundered. Others said, An angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, The Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have the light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus, and departed 
and did hide himself from them. And we'll end our reading there, knowing the Lord will bless again the reading of his word to each of our hearts. We'll ask our brother to come, please, and bring the necessary announcements. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome along to this gospel service here in Coleraine Free Presbyterian Church. It's good to see you here tonight, and again with a number of visitors with us, and to you we extend a special word of welcome, and also to those joining us on our webcast, we thank you also for joining, and as usual, we would encourage you, if you're on social media, uh, to share out the gospel message so that others can hear it tonight while it is being preached. We want to welcome back our preacher for today, the Reverend John Woods from John Knox Memorial Free Presbyterian Church. We welcome him and his family again uh, to this service tonight. The announcements then for the incoming week as follows. Uh, on Tuesday night at 8 o'clock we have our prayer meeting and Bible study and that will take place here in the church and also webcast on the usual channels on Facebook Sermon Audio and also on YouTube and our interim moderator the Reverend Derek Irwin will be the preacher on Tuesday night. Then no other meetings in the church until next Lord's Day Sunday the 11th of July. The service is at the usual times of half past 11 and half past six and the preacher is the Reverend Stephen McRae who is the minister of Carrick Fergus Free Presbyterian Church. I'd mentioned this morning some uh, events taking place over the next number of weeks and to uh, just to advertise those to you but also to ask you to remember them in prayer. Uh, Bush Mills Free Presbyterian Church is having a drive-in mission and that will take place from Monday the 19th through to Friday the 23rd of July and the preacher is the Reverend uh, William McRae and he's the evangelist for those nights of mission and that mission will be a drive-in mission and take place in the car park there at our Bush Mills Church each night at 8 p.m. so if you're in the area uh, on holiday and want to support that then uh, the people in Bush Mills will be very glad to see you and then also in our own church we have a holiday Bible club that's planned for August from the 16th through to the 20th here at the church uh, so please do remember that Bible Club in your prayers. Mr. Jonathan Storey uh, will be the speaker on that occasion. And each night there will be a theme from the Word of God, Great Escapes in the Bible, so a different one for each night uh, of the week. And we'll make more uh, or provide more details about that Holiday Bible Club as uh, the weeks go by. So do thank you for that. I also want to thank Mrs. Patterson and Heather Linden for uh, providing the music for us today. I think those are all the announcements made subject to the will of God, and we'll hand back now to the Reverend Woods. Thank you. Thank our brother again for making the announcements and for the words of welcome. It is good to be with you today. Of course, we always like coming back to this part of the world after spending some years in Bush Mills, and normally it's on holiday, and it is really on holiday this time as well. But we are glad to see you, and of course, uh, when you're in this part of the country, usually some of your colleagues end up in the congregation on holiday too, so we're glad to have the Reverend Mrs. Harris here as well. It's always good to know, and of course the Reverend Mrs. Patterson. If uh, you need a preacher and you're not able to uh, finish out, there's always some in the congregation. But of course it is a great privilege to be with you, and we pray again tonight, especially if you're here and you're not saved, that tonight you might even consider the great need of your soul and for each of us who are saved, that we might rejoice again in what the Lord has done for us and realize what a great debt that we owe to him. We're going to turn again, please, to this passage we have read from tonight in John chapter 12. And it is particularly the verse 27 into the verse 28 that I want to draw your attention to tonight, the words spoken by the Lord Jesus on this occasion and in John 12 and verse 27, the Lord Jesus said, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause 
came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. We're going to seek the Lord in prayer, and maybe again I could ask you to stand just as we seek the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord even to speak to us now through the preaching of His Word. Father in heaven, we thank Thee again tonight for the great privilege that it is that we have Thy Word in our own language, that we can even tonight consider the words spoken by the Saviour when he was here upon this scene of time. And we thank thee that thy word is a living word. It's a speaking word. We thank thee it's a word that is so far superior to any other written work or book that we may read. For we thank thee here we have your words, all that you would have us to know concerning yourself, concerning ourselves, concerning our sin, concerning eternity concerning the way of salvation. And we pray tonight, now as we come to the preaching of thy word, that thy spirit would be in control tonight, that again beyond the voice of the preacher, we pray that each one will be conscious that thou art speaking. We thank thee that thou art able to speak to those that are out of Christ and awaken them to their great need, and even to bring them to that experience of being born again of thy spirit. Thou art able to speak to each child of God to draw us closer to Thyself, to cause us even afresh to realize what a great debt we owe to Thee. And so I pray that Thou wouldst fill me afresh with Thy Spirit. Speak to me through Thy Word and speak through me tonight, I pray. We pray this night that Your kingdom will be extended even in the salvation of precious souls. We ask it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you were to begin at the opening verse of this 12th chapter of John's Gospel, you would discover that the events recorded in it are certainly leading up to that time where the Lord Jesus would give himself as the great sacrifice for sin on the cross at Calvary. In the opening verse, it records how it was six days before the Passover. And the Lord Jesus came to Bethany. He came to that place where Lazarus and Mary and Martha lived. Lazarus, of course, had been raised from the dead by the Savior. And we read of how the Lord Jesus sat down to eat with them. Lazarus was at the table. Martha was serving And we find that Mary, in these opening verses of John 12, she took a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and she anointed the feet of the Lord Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. One of the twelve, Judas Iscariot, the one who would betray the Lord Jesus, he made the complaint that this ointment should have been sold and the money used for the poor, instead of it being used to anoint the Lord Jesus. The Scripture, of course, reveals the hypocrisy of Judas. He did not speak those words, we're told in verse 6, because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. He had the bag, and he bare what was put therein. But the answer of the Lord Jesus In verses 7 and 8, the words which he spoke are one evidence that the time was drawing near when he would lay down his life and death and be buried. Because he said in verse 7, Let her alone. Against the day of my burying has she kept this. For the poor always she have with you but me ye have not always. And the fact that the Lord Jesus spoke of the day of his burying, he was highlighting the fact that the time was drawing near when he would die and he would be buried. Of course, he would rise again from the dead. And as you continue on down the chapter, you discover in verse 12 where we began our reading that 
the Lord Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And the people took the branches of the palm trees. They went forth to meet him. In verse 13 they said, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And of course the Lord Jesus entering Jerusalem in the manner in which he did was a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy of Zechariah 9 and the verse 9, which is quoted there in the verse 15. As we then continue on down the chapter in verse 20, we read of certain Greeks who were coming up to worship at the feast. And they spoke to Philip. They expressed their desire to see the Lord Jesus. And when Philip came and told Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip went and told the Lord Jesus again, and what the Lord Jesus said, he was highlighting that the time was drawing so close when he would lay down his life and death as the great sacrifice for sin. He spoke there in verse 24. In these words, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And of course, by way of that illustration, he was really pointing to himself because he would die. Through his death, there would be much fruit. Through his death, countless, a countless multitude of sinners would experience eternal life, spiritual life. And so there's no doubt that all of the happenings in the record of this chapter are drawing near to the cross to the Lord Jesus, laying down his life and death. And I want us tonight to focus in upon what the Lord Jesus went on to say in verse 27 and into verse 28. Because as he continued to speak, he was speaking in light of the fact that the time was drawing so near when he would lay down his life as the great sacrifice for sin. And as we think upon this tonight, of course, we're reminded if we're saved that we would not be saved tonight, we could not be saved if the Lord Jesus had not went to the cross as the great sacrifice for sin, to satisfy a holy God, to shed His blood, to wash away our sins. And if you're not saved tonight, you of course need to realize that it is only because of what the Lord Jesus did accomplish by His cross work that you can be saved tonight. But of course the matter is urgent. Maybe for years you've put off the matter of salvation. And maybe you think you can continue to put the matter off until some time in the future. And yet the Word of God reminds us that now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. That today if ye hear His voice harden not your heart. And as we think of what the Lord Jesus said here in verses 27 and 28, in light of the fact that his going to the cross was drawing so near, I want you to think first of all of how his soul was troubled. Because in verse 27, the Lord Jesus said, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Now is my soul troubled. And of course we do well to ask the question tonight, why was the soul of the Lord Jesus troubled? What brought this trouble to his soul? Well, it was because he was the sin bearer and the burden of the sins of his people that he was going to bear away on that cross was pressing down with a great weight upon his soul. It was not that the death of the cross in itself, in the sense that others died by crucifixion, it was not that in itself 
that troubled the soul of the Lord Jesus. But the Lord Jesus knew that his death on the cross, even by crucifixion, there was something more to it than even those who were hanging on either side of him would experience by dying the death of crucifixion. The Lord Jesus knew that in his very soul he would bear the wrath of God for the sins of his people. We cannot tonight even begin to understand or imagine how troubled the soul of the Lord Jesus must have been. The great burden that was weighing down upon him as the sin bearer. When he would get to the cross, when he would be nailed to that cross, you remember how the, the Gospels record the seven sayings that he uttered on the cross. And one of those sayings he uttered was from Psalm 22 when he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? To be forsaken by his Father for a time there on the cross was that which troubled his soul. To be made sin for us who knew no sin. The Lord Jesus was going to the cross as a sin bearer. He was going there as the great sacrifice for sin, the great substitute for sinners. And how that troubled his soul. If you turn over a page to the next chapter, John chapter 13, and you come down to the verse 21, we read again of the Lord Jesus being troubled. Chapter 13. In the verse 21, when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. He was troubled in his spirit as he considered the events that were taking him right there to the cross at Calvary as the sin bearer and the great sacrifice for sin. But you know, as we consider the troubling of his soul, when you move on into chapter 14 of John's Gospel and read those very familiar words as the Lord Jesus addressed his disciples, those who believed in him, those who were trusting in him, because of his trouble of soul, he was able to say to them, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Because of what he was going to endure on the cross, their sins would be forgiven. Because of what he would endure on the cross, they someday would enter into the Father's house that he went on to speak about in those opening verses of John chapter 14. Because he would be forsaken of God for a time, all who put their trust in him will never be forsaken by God. If you're not saved tonight, your soul ought to be troubled with the thought that at this moment you're separated from God by your sin. And if you were to die tonight in your sin out of Christ, you would be separated from God for all eternity. You would experience and endure the wrath of God in that terrible place called hell. You know, back in Luke's gospel, in the chapter 24, we read of the Lord Jesus, of course, in the garden of Gethsemane. And again there in the garden of Gethsemane, the great burden of our sins was weighing down upon him. And there... In Luke 22 and the verse 44, Luke 22 and the verse 44, it says of the Lord Jesus, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And there in Gethsemane, when you 
turn back to Mark's account in Mark 14 and 34, you will find there that Mark records that there in the Garden of Gethsemane, as he spoke to Peter and James and John, as he took them a little further from the other disciples, that he said to them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. That sorrow of soul, that trouble of soul was because of my sins and because of your sins. As the hymn writer put it, none of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed, nor how dark was the night which the Lord passed through, ere he found the sheep that was lost. If you're saved tonight, each one of us who are saved, we ought to thank God that Christ endured this trouble of soul and went to the cross and laid down his life as the sin bearer he bare in his own body, our sins to the tree. He suffered unto death, he shed his blood, that we might be saved, that we might be forgiven, that we not, might not be forsaken by God. But again, if you're not saved, if you're not saved, your soul ought to be troubled tonight. And that troubling of your soul ought to drive you to that place you will cry out to the Lord for forgiveness, for salvation. Place your faith in the Lord Jesus and what He accomplished for the salvation of all who will turn from sin and trust in Him. When you come back to these words in John chapter 12 in the verse 27, not only do we see that the soul of the Savior was troubled, but I want you to see in the second place that he had a settled purpose, a settled purpose. Because there in verse 27, as the Lord Jesus spoke, and as he said, now is my soul troubled, he went on, and what shall I say? In other words, what shall I say concerning this trouble of soul? Father, save me from this hour? Shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? But for this cause came I unto this hour. How can I ask my Father to save me from this hour? It's for this cause, this purpose that I came unto this hour. You know, this was drawing near to the climax of the earthly ministry of the Savior, his going to the cross as a sacrifice for sin, his going there to finish the work that his Father had sent him to do. And when you look at the verse 23, here in John 12, where the Lord Jesus began to speak, leading on to these words we're considering, he said, according to verse 23, and Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. The hour is come. And as you go through this Gospel of John, you will find the Lord Jesus on a number of occasions speaking about this hour. You will find the record of the Apostle John in this Gospel, and he refers to this hour. This time in the great purpose of God, for which the Lord Jesus had come into this world to go to the cross at Calvary. You will find back in chapter 2 of John's Gospel when the Lord Jesus was at the marriage in Cana of Galilee and Mary had spoken to him of the fact that they had run out of wine at the marriage feast. And in John 2 and verse 4, Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And as you continue through this gospel, as I've said, there are a number of references to this hour. When you get to chapter 7 and the verse 30, chapter 7 and the verse 30, we are told, Then they sought to take him. That is, those who were opposed to the Lord Jesus, they sought to take him. There were many who 
wanted rid of the Lord Jesus and wanted him put to death before he would ever get to the cross. And so it says there, then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. Again, when you move into chapter 8 and verse 20, there there are similar words. These words speak Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. He had a settled purpose in mind. And there was a settled purpose in his father's great plan. When he would there on that cross give himself as a great sacrifice for sin. He would lay down his life for the sins of his people. When you get to chapter 12 where we have been reading tonight, as I've said in verse 23, now he's saying the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And into the next chapter, chapter 13 and verse 1, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew, listen to it, that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. And he had this settled purpose in mind. He knew this hour was ahead of him right through his time here upon earth. And of course, when you get to chapter 17 in the opening verse, just before they went to the garden of Gethsemane, as the Lord Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven, And addressed his father, he said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. The Lord Jesus had this settled purpose in mind, despite his trouble of soul, even here in John 12. He's saying concerning his trouble of soul, What shall I say? Shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? No, it's for this cause that I came unto this hour. The Lord Jesus knew it was so necessary, so necessary that he go to the cross as the great sacrifice for sin to save his people from their sins. That's the purpose for which he was born into this world. He was given that name, Jesus, for he came to save his people from their sins. There's a little verse in Luke chapter 9 and the verse 51, and it again highlights this settled purpose that the Lord Jesus had right through his ministry. As he went through his ministry with the cross before him, and it tells us there in Luke 9 and the verse 51, and it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. There was again that settled purpose. You see, the Lord Jesus knew, as Peter would later record in 1 Peter 1 and 20, that he was foreordained from before the foundation of the world to be the sacrifice for sin. The one of whom John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God, that taketh away the sin of the world. He came to lay down his life. He came to lay it down and take it up again. He said in Matthew's gospel in the garden that he could have called the angels. But no, he he had come with a settled purpose to go all the way to the cross. And he did go all the way and he, he finished the work. He laid down his life. He was buried. But he rose again. He ascended back to heaven. He's at the Father's right hand. The work of sacrifice is finished. The work of intercession continues. And tonight, if you're not saved, the work has been done by Christ. It's not your works that will gain you heaven or God's favor. It's not your church attendance. It's not the best that you can do. It's only what Christ has done can make you right with God. It's only by you turning from your sin and trusting in Christ what he has done by 
his cross were. And you're not trusting him tonight. There's a final thought here in these verses. In John 12, we've been thinking of verse 27, but just into verse 28. Because not only does the Lord Jesus speak about his soul being troubled, and not only do we see this settled purpose that he had to go all the way to the cross, but we see his supplication to his Father. Because in verse 28, he says, Father, glorify thy name. This was the desire of the Lord Jesus in all that he did in coming into this world to glorify his Father. That was his purpose. And he knew that his cross work would glorify his Father, showing God's justice, which must punish him. But showing God's mercy in punishing his Son, as the great substitute, so that sinners could go free. This prayer of the Lord Jesus was repeated in words we've already referred to in John 17 and 1. Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. The Lord Jesus submitted to the great plan of salvation, to bring glory to his Father. And of course, in it all, he was also glorified. And the supplication which he offered here in John 12 and 28, what we see immediately, we, we know, of course, that all of the prayers of Christ are answered. And when he said, Father, glorify thy name, we read John's record, then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Remember the voice of the Father was heard from heaven at the beginning of the Lord's ministry when he was being baptized. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The voice of the Father was heard from heaven on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my beloved Son. Hear ye him. Here we have the Savior saying, Father, glorify thy name. And the voice from heaven says, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. You read through the Gospels right from the coming of the Lord Jesus into this world as a little babe, right through all the years he spent upon this scene of time, right through his public ministry, all that he did was for the glory of his Father. And at this very moment in John 12 and 28, as he said, Father, glorify thy name, he knew that in his cross work he would bring glory to his Father. And you know, if you're saved tonight, you ought, and I ought, and all that we do to have that desire to glorify our Heavenly Father, to glorify our Savior, because of what he has done for us. And if you're not saved, if you will turn from your sin and trust in Christ, you'll be able to live a life of bringing glory to God the Father, bringing glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in verse 29 of John 12, we read of how the people that stood by, they heard the voice from heaven, but, but some said it thundered. Others said, an angel speak to him. And the Lord Jesus answered and said in verse 30, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. The voice of the Father from heaven was another indication of who the Lord Jesus was and what he had come to do. And my friend, if you're not saved, God's word, God through his word, would speak to you tonight, presenting to you his Son and what he endured as the great sacrifice for sin, but calling you to turn from your sin and trust in him for salvation. Because either tonight, if you're not saved, you turn from sin 
You trust in Christ for salvation. Or else you go away continuing to reject him. Continuing on that broad road, which the Bible says leads to destruction. And I trust tonight, if you're not saved, as we have considered the Savior and what trouble of soul he endured for the salvation of sinners and what a settled purpose he had in coming into this world to do all that was necessary for the salvation of sinners and in it all glorifying his Father, that you will even tonight bow the knee, turn from your sin and trust in Christ for salvation. Let's just bow in prayer as we bring our service to a close. If you are here tonight and you are concerned about your soul, maybe you'd like to speak to me after the meeting, maybe, maybe some other child of God in the meeting that's more well known to you tonight, realize that the salvation of your soul is the most important matter. There's many important things in life, but... This is much more important than anything else. That your soul is saved, that your sins are forgiven before you stand before God. You don't have to speak to me tonight or anyone else here. You can cry out to the Lord even where you're sitting tonight. But let me encourage you tonight to seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. Father, we thank Thee tonight for the Lord Jesus. We thank Thee for His obedience unto death, even the death of the cross. We thank Thee that by His life and by His death and by His resurrection that He has done all that is necessary to save sinners from sin. And we pray tonight for any that are out of Christ. We pray tonight that Thou wilt trouble their souls. That tonight... They will realize that there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. That they will realize that what profit will it bring to them even if they were to gain the whole world and lose their own souls. Father, we pray that by the Holy Spirit tonight that thou wilt do that work that the preacher cannot do. That thou wilt convict. That thou wilt convert. And so, Lord, we pray that your name will be glorified tonight. We pray that thou wilt separate us now in thy fear and with thy blessing. Take us to your homes in safety.